Good afternoon. Welcome to the Interior Museum's Lunchtime Lecture Series. My name is Diana Ziegler. I'm the Acting Director of the Museum. Uh, we host this series each month focusing on uh, the work of the Department of the Interior and our various bureaus. I'm happy to be highlighting the work of the Fish and Wildlife Service this month with Mark Houston. He's the Branch Chief of Environmental Response and Restoration for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He provides guidance and technical support and budget support for the service's oil spill and natural resource damage assessment and restoration programs. Uh, he also oversees a national interagency agreement with the EPA. The EPA funds service biologists to provide technical and biological support to the EPA's Superfund program. Prior to moving to the DC area, Mark worked as a technical liaison to the EPA's response team in Edison, New Jersey, where he participated in planning ecological risk assessments, conducting field studies, and responding to oil and hazardous material spills. Before joining the service, uh, Mark worked in the private industry as an oil spill and emergency response contractor, where he provided biological and technical support at oil spills and hazardous waste site incidents and cleanups. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Mark Houston. He'll be taking some questions after the talk. Just as a little uh, a recap, Fish and Wildlife Service is broken up into eight separate regions and then a headquarters region, which is our Washington office. Um, each region has a lot of autonomy, but right now when we do oil spill response, each of the regions has responsibility for handling the response first. And then if it needs more people or more resources, they uh, bump it up to the Washington office. Um, currently, Fish and Wildlife Service has about a little over 9,000 employees. and. Uh, our annual budget is a little over $2 billion, but um, about half of that is passed through money uh, for grants. Our spill program is handled through our environmental contaminants program, and that's um, mostly biologists that, that do uh, toxicology, have backgrounds in spill response or hazardous waste evaluations. And we have about, uh, right now, 50 people throughout the country that identify themselves as an environmental contaminant biologist and then another maybe 70 folks that consider themselves as natural resource damage assessment biologists. And I'll explain the difference between that uh, a little bit later. Fish and Wildlife Service's responsibilities, we have a couple things that we do when we have an oil spill. And so before a spill, we're involved in planning, contingency planning. Um, and then the thing that, that we uh, bring to the table at a spill is we have a lot of biologists. We have over 700 offices nationwide uh, in the wildlife refuges hatcheries, ecological services offices. So those folks have a lot of knowledge of the local biota and the local resources. So that's what we're providing um, during a spill. But again, before a spill, a lot of uh, planning and training. During the spill, we're supporting our response agency. Coast Guard has responsibility for leading spill response on coastal waters, and EPA has responsibility for inland waters. And so we're providing technical support to them during that cleanup. We're also responsible, uh, our, our biggest responsibility is wildlife protection. So again, uh, protecting those resources, either the, the animals themselves or the habitat. We have uh, legal responsibilities for the Endangered Species Act and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And then again, our, our employee safety is very um, important to us. And then after a spill, once it's all said and done and it's cleaned up, is restoring that habitat as closely as possible back to what it was before it was oiled and it was cleaned up. Um, an actual oil spill causes damage to the environment, and then oftentimes the actual cleanup itself causes some damage. If you think about an oil spill, if they're going to go in there with uh, you know, a bulldozer and drag material out of there, if it's a wetland that gets oiled, they're going to go in there and remove that. That causes physical damage to the removal itself, and so we're going to work to prevent that. Anybody familiar with the incident command system? Have you heard about the incident command system? Oops, okay. So we operate under that. Uh, scenario as well. Sorry, the slide's not really clear. Um, this system was developed by the fire program back in the late 1960s, and it's evolved to the point now that any kind of emergency, even non-emergency response by the federal government falls under this framework. And the thing that you'll always see on anti command uh, structure is, so there's a federal on-scene coordinator, so that's the federal response person with the lead, a state, and then if there's, a, for example, an oil spill, you would have the responsible party. So they're leading the response. And then you'll always find these four sections. So operations, planning, logistics, and finance. 
And so the place that the Fish and Wildlife Service fits in this uh, organization is here under operations in the wildlife branch. We also may fit up here under the Natural Research Damage Assessment Branch. You'll see that's a dotted line, so that has some outside responsibilities. And the thing that happens when you operate under an insight command system is when you go and your name or your organization is assigned one of those boxes, is you lose your identity as to what your real day job is. So for example, if you're, uh, you know, I'm a, I work at a, I do a desk job now mostly, but if I were to go out there and be assigned to the wildlife branch to collect animals, that's what my job would be. And my management structure would be this, not my day to day job management structure. And it's a really effective system. You can grow these, you can add as many boxes as you want, or you can shrink it. You know, very small stone you have, it would collapse all these boxes together and have, you know, maybe one person doing multiple functions. Bigger stills, uh, Deepwater Horizon, for example, when they would print this work chart, it would cover that entire wall. So I mentioned the things that we do before a spill, and so we do a lot of contingency planning. That's working with the Coast Guard and National Response Team and looking at um, what we have to do to plan the event that there's a spill, both postal spills and inland spills. We participate in drills. We, we specifically look at things where we're um, providing people training in wildlife collection. And the one thing I wanted to put in the top picture there, it's hard to see, but it's actually folks training and handling a domestic duck. And so it's giving folks the ability to handle wildlife. Um, the picture below, it's hard to read, but this says sea otter capture, capture kit. And so again, that training happens in Alaska. There's the potential if something happens that you would get oil sea otters. So you want to be trained to handle those animals and have equipment ready if you needed to collect them if they were foiled. Um, SONS, that stands for Spills of National Significance. We participate in those drills as well. Um, they're very large drills. Um, the last one was in um, Portland, Maine, I believe, and it involved many federal agencies and a lot of resources to that kind of drill. Um, Coast Guard put that drill on. They can move hunters, they bring a helicopter, so it's a, it's a pretty big deal. Um, again, our responsibilities during a response is that we're looking at endangered species. That's uh, we're legally uh, one of our mandates is to protect uh, endangered species. And this is not necessarily protecting them from the oil, although we try to do that too, but mostly looking at when you're out there as a response that you're not doing things worse to impact endangered species. Our national wildlife refuges, we have um, over 500 national wildlife refuges, 159 of them which are coastal, so it can be you know, really severely impacted by oil spills that are coastal. Um, with things recently, we had a spill um, about a month ago that was just a, a tank truck uh, you know, uh, overturned. But the problem is, is it landed on a national wildlife refuge, so there you have a, you know, a spill that's an oil spill. Nothing to do with the coastline, it's just a traffic accident that actually spills oil on a national wildlife refuge. And then lastly, migratory birds, which is I think what a lot of folks equate us with is um, actually capturing and cleaning migratory birds. Um, we do a couple things. So uh, you want to recover birds. Uh, obviously, if they're oiled and they die, you want to pick them up and, and keep them out of the environment. Because what happens is uh, a lot of animals will come in and scavenge on those. And so they're just spreading that oil around. They're getting oiled where they maybe wouldn't be oiled. We want to recover as many birds as we can that are oiled and uh, uh, triage the sick birds. Um, again, if we can, we try to rehabilitate them, you know, wash them off, and release them. If they're too oiled, we may end up euthanizing them. We do establish the rehabilitation operations, so uh, most times it's with the contracting uh, mechanism that's by the rehabilitation agency that we use. If it's a small spill off in the local humane society, we can come out and help us out and set something up. To uh, clean birds or clean animals. And then lastly, we do things to keep animals out of the oil. And so we're looking at different caging techniques to keep things away from actually getting into it. So, again, wildlife capture, just what it sounds like. You're going out there, um, this is a picture from the Gulf, uh, wading. Um, these are all pelicans, all these little white dots are pelicans. This is a pelican breeding island. This is a Fish and Wildlife Service person holding an oiled pelican that she just. Um, it's hard to see, but the pelicans were white, and that one's pretty oil. Um, different species of birds or different animals can handle different levels of oil. Pelicans are a pretty robust bird, and you, know, you wouldn't think one like that would survive, but they did pretty good. Other species of birds um, 
takes very little oil on them to make them sick to the point where they have Kind of buried that. Everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's that? Jessica, it's the same thing. Yeah, a bit of oil. That's a bit of oil. So, one of the things we wrestle with when we collect animals is we do keep track of what is injured and what's impacted because, as part of our restoration, we need to know what kind of restorations do to restore species or restore habitats. It's very difficult sometimes when you capture wild animals to actually figure out what they are. This one's kind of extremely you could probably figure it out because there's not that many birds that are really big like a goose like that and you would know. But if you have oil or a lot of oil, say it's, uh, migratory birds or small passerine birds that get oil, sometimes it's really difficult to figure out um, what they are, especially if you've collected them and they've already passed. One of the things that we do is we go out with the response crews and we make sure that they don't make anything worse. And so I just put a couple pictures up here to show you the type of things that we're looking out for. So these are actually black skimmer chicks on a beach. And they're right out in the middle of the beach. So if you think that if you had a crew out there looking to clean up oil, they would step on those and not even realize that they did that. And so we have people that go out and actually go with the cleanup crews and look for species like that. Um, we can flag those areas, we can make recommendations, for example, um, in this instance it's probably not, you don't see any oil there, so we may flag that area and say, well, just stay away from here, don't do any cleanup, you know, we'll monitor it. Um, this is a least turn, also very small, kind of in the uh, vegetation there, but it's the same type of thing. And so based on the species that are present or things that are impacted, may determine how we are going to look at what kind of actions we're going to take. Um, I mentioned hazing. One of the things that we try to do is if there's an oil spill is to keep the animals out of it. Um, the biggest thing of the deep water is that so they haze it, where do they go? You know, we have hundreds of miles of, of beach and oil. All we're doing is hazing it from one area of oil into another area of oil. So not a great technique there. But traditionally, um, what you want to try to do is just keep the animals out of the oil or out from being impacted. Um, we use some pretty uh, non-technical things. We use scare balloons like you can buy from your garden. Um, uh, metallic tape works, um, deep water horizon honestly, we're using high plates on, on sticks for areas, you know, because it's pretty effective with those things where you have no to keep birds out of there. Uh, propane cannons, it's just great what it sounds, you have a propane tank up to it and it makes a cannon type sound. You can set these so that they fire at random intervals. This one is actually set up on the ground, but we have set them up. You can set them up in a flat bottom boat, you kind of tow them out where you need to do set them up to fire, and then you just change out the tanks when you need to. The problem with a lot of those things is, uh, especially in urban areas where animals are used to noise and distractions, is it doesn't really help that much. Um, uh, they can get used to those noises, they can get desensitized to those noises, so after a period of time, they just don't work very well. A lot of times they'll work pretty good for a day or two, and then they just get used to that kind of noise, especially if it's something that's happening on a consistent basis. There are some uh, newer techniques. This is a floatable buoy. Um, this is a, a Breco. This one actually has programmable sounds in it. And it can do things like dog barking, it can do sirens, it can do whistles, it can do um, a bunch of different noises. You can set it to do random. It floats so you can put it on an anchor and a buoy and put it out somewhere um, to make all different kinds of noises to help aid animals away from the area. But those are types of things that we do just to keep animals from coming into areas that are oil. Again, for smaller oil spills, it works out really well. For bigger ones, you just find the risk of hazing them from one area into another area that's already oil. Um, I did want to mention that we do a lot of animal collection that's not just birds. And so, for example, we have an oiled snake here, and you can't see that picture too well, but that's an oiled alligator. And so we do um, some regional training classes to help people handle different types of animals. We do, in, in the southeast, uh, a couple years ago, had a training class where the state of Louisiana brought over some alligators for us, showed us how to capture them, and then let folks try to do that. Um, if we know we're going to have bigger alligators, or a lot of alligators, we do try to get folks that are specialized in handling them to get them for us. Um, this snake looks okay. We had a spill a couple months ago in Arkansas. I don't know if folks saw it in the paper. It was a pipeline breaking in a residential 
this element, you saw the pictures of the oil flowing down the street. Uh, the thing is, is that it flowed down the street and then into a drainage uh, ditch and flowed into a wetland. And so we had over 70 cottonmouth snakes that got boiled. And so in that instance, we were lucky that the University of Believer in Alabama is not too far away and has a snake expert. And so they were able to help us determine um, you know, which of those snakes could be cleaned, which ones could be captured. Um, snakes are really hard um, you know, once they ingest the oil to are fairly fatal, so um, not much success in rescuing those snakes. Um, Enbridge pipeline spill that happened in 2010, a couple months after deep water, that was also uh, a pipeline break in Michigan. Uh, we had over uh, 3,000 turtles that were oiled, so which is a common glass turtles. And the issue there was uh, that's a lot of turtles, and that takes a lot of capacity to. Uh, both store those, not store them, but uh, capture those turtles, clean them. The problem we had with those is that by the time the turtles were getting healthy enough to be released, it was getting into the winter months and the turtles not hardy. And so um, trying to find facilities to overwinter those turtles until the spring until we could release them once the weather had cleared up. And so in that instance, we're using, uh, we had four zoos come uh, and help us with that response and take those turtles to Again, so not just not just birds, although that's that's what we traditionally go after. Um, we don't do things all by ourselves. We have a lot of partner agencies that help us with the response. Uh, other federal agencies or other DOI bureaus um, help. They have their specialties. NOAA, National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, they um, have a lot of experience in handling uh, impacts to fish, impacts to marine mammals, impacts to Turtles there are usually partner with us in the spill that's the coastal. We work very closely with the, the states and our local communities, again, because the states often have uh, a lot of spill responders. They have a lot of knowledge of the local areas as well. We work with professional rehabilitators. Um, Tri State Bird Rescue is here in Delaware. International Bird Rescue is in California, but they have teams that will fly with really short notice uh, anywhere in the country and set up um, a rehab facility to help. Capture animals. Zoos, we work with zoos and aquariums all the time because those folks have a lot of experience handling live animals. We do have veterinarians, Fish and Wildlife Service has veterinarians on staff, um, but we traditionally don't use um, veterinarians that are local because their experience tends to be with domestic animals. Although we do, if that's, uh, you know, if we need that kind of help, again, they come over to help us. But again, a lot of times zoos and aquariums have those folks that are really skilled in handling wild animals. and those. This ability to um, have a lot of holding facilities and places that they can keep them. Um, I did want to just give you a deep water horizon of the big spill that we've all had over the last couple of years and just kind of highlight some of the things for the service that we were involved with during that spill. It was, uh, we still have people actively uh, participating in the response part of that spill right now, which for us at any other time would be um, huge. but. Um, from April to April, so April 2010 to 2011, we have spent 540,000 hours just for the oil spill response, just for the Fish and Wildlife Service. It was the full 20% of our entire workforce spent um, at one point or another down to that spill. And so what we did, we had a couple big functions. Wildlife branch, so again, we had centers in uh, Louisiana and Alabama they set up some satellite centers, but again, out there collecting uh, animals. We call it READS, that acronym stands for Resource Advisors, and so that would be a person, for example, that's going out with the cleanup crew and the birds that I showed you in that stand, that they're the ones that are actually going with the crew and making sure that they're not doing more damage than, than good when they do the cleanup. RARs, Resource Advisors, similar type of position, but they're very specifically focused on endangered species. And then the natural resource damage assessment. And so when we do a spill, again, we separate it. Spill response, and that's actually doing the actual cleanups and the, the wildlife portion of it. And then the natural resource damage assessment is evaluating what those impacts of the spill were to the biota or the habitat, and then figuring out how to just put it back. This is just the wildlife branch, uh, remember the incident command schematic that I put up there. This is just the wildlife branch schematic just for the one center in Louisiana. 
And this was just the staff that were working in the office. This does not include all the people that were out in the field collecting birds. We had on any given day about 300 people out there collecting birds. Um, again, I apologize, it's not real clear, but um, a threatened and endangered species coordinator. We have sea mammals and sea turtles, wildlife recon, oil life, wildlife recovery. We have rehab, rescue, and removal. We have, uh, at one point, we had uh, five different rehabilitation centers. We had one base center, and then we had a couple smaller triage centers. So we had somebody that was responsible for managing those. Uh, capture, transport, animal care, necropsy, um, uh, a bunch of different recon units. We had a person in, the, in kind of the headquarters area that handled those uh, administrative functions related to those. So again, as you needed people or you needed functions, you can build this organization or shrink it as you need it. Um, this is uh, Wildlife Branch. This is how we operate during a spill. Um, every spill I've ever been to was something like this. You're all getting into a room with cables. And so um, we had about, uh, for the, the one, Louisiana is, is probably about half the size of this room with 30 people working in cables. You get your little space and your, and your computer and you, and you just do things. You know, you're working on wildlife plans. You're working on how to get oiled animals back. The biggest thing with deep water is a lot of folks would say they capture an animal and they'd be working on a great bed. 50 miles offshore, and so how do you get that back to shoreline? Um, again, when you have something like this, everybody's assigned a responsibility. So you did your day job, you don't do whatever your day job is, you have this responsibility during the duration that you're down at this spill. Um, the, the deep water horizon spill in Louisiana was a little different for us because oftentimes we just go and stay in hotels. and um, Coastal Louisiana is very remote, and so staying in hotels, you had quite a bit of distance from the hotel once you got on water to where you actually where the animals were. So we have the ability to uh, contract these crew barges, and these are crew barges that are used on uh, a lot of times for drilling. Um, and so what we would do is we would pick people up at the airport and we would shuttle them by boat to the crew barge, and then they would stay on the crew barge for up to three weeks, and then. Uh, every day they would get their assignments. We would prepare maps for them. We would prepare information that, you know, for this day, you and your boat crew are going to go out and recon this area. And so then they would just work off of the barge. And the, uh, you can't see it here, but behind the barge, there's just a row of boats. And so uh, one boat driver, one first uh, crewman, and then two people doing the wildlife capture. Um, and then the, the little barge behind it was where the equipment was stored. And these, are, these weren't bad. I mean, they you know, had a bad end, but they did have a chef on board or a cook on board, so uh, folks stayed pretty well. Had satellite links, so you could get you know, internet hookup and, and you know, maintain contact with um, uh, our command post. Um, rehabilitation center. Oftentimes, what they'll do is find um, again humane society that's not a really big spill. They'll set something up in a temporary structure if they need to. Um, so folks familiar with the 84 lumber? And so this is an old 84 lumber facility, about 250,000 square feet under roof. Um, this is up in Hammond, Louisiana, which is north of where the spill was. But the thing that was nice about this rehab center is it was right next to an airport with a runway. And so they could land helicopters there and planes there, plus the highway was there too. So they could either drive the animals there or they could fly them up, uh, either by plane or by helicopter. Um, see this, it's, I mean, it's just a huge facility. They have holding pens. Um, these are very large. These are for the pelicans. Pelicans did pretty good if you put one in a pen. Um, birds are pretty stressed when you net them and um, put them in a bag and dry them. And they're sick because they're oiled. Um, so they're not usually in very good shape when you get into a rehab center, even if they weren't. Very and so what you need to do is get those animals stable. You need to get them in a pen like this with the dark sides on it and just let them calm down. Initial triage is to give them, if they think that they've ingested a lot of oil, is to give them Pepto-Bismol or activated carbon. Again, if they've eaten any of that oil to kind of um, stop that, that toxic effect of the oil. Get them water, a lot of times they're dehydrated. And just let them sit for about 24 hours. So we do not 
immediately clean animals, unless it's a real emergency treatment system. But for the most part, clean off the eyes, uh, clean out the nose, sit them out, clean up a little bit, but just get them stable and let them sit. We found that we had a lot better success of cleaning them after they're stabilized rather than just grabbing them, running them to a rehab center, and starting to scrub them. And that goes with any animal that we collect. Um, we've had a recent spill where we've collected, I think, six beavers. Um, you know, so a lot of work just uh, collecting those beavers, taking them, washing them, getting them stabilized. Um, after they're washed, they're put in holding pens. Um, these are also a lot of juvenile pelicans. This is time, given the time of year, a lot of juvenile pelicans from the water horizon. Um, so again, you, they're very stressed because they've been exposed to oil. They're stressed because of the handling. They're in captivity. You get them cleaned up. You get them stabilized. You let them clean. They need some additional time just to get feathers back in shape, get those oils spread around. And so we just put them in these holding areas. Um, there is a point there, though, when the health starts to decline again, because as they're getting healthier, the problem is now they're in captivity. So now they're getting stressed again. So um, it's a very fine line about how long you hold these animals versus how long you release them. And so, again, at deep water, a real struggle because it's not like you could just, okay, so this group of animals is ready to be released. We're just going to drive them back down the road to where we caught them and release them. So that oil was still coming. So um, early on in the spill, we were, we were taking animals quite a bit distance away from where we actually captured them. But usually the intent is a very short term spill or a smaller spill to put those animals back as close to we can as where we catch them. Good question. Um, do they really use Dawn dish detergent? They do. We do use Dawn dish detergent. Um, we always have. I can't tell you what the ingredient, I mean, I don't know what the ingredient is that makes a Dawn the better one versus another, but we do use basic blue Dawn. I will tell you it's not quite as nice as those TV commercials point out where that. I mean, I said the duck that's really happy uh, when it's all uh, said and done. Um, I've never seen a bird that, that looks like that after it's been scrubbed, um, nor any other animal for that matter. Um, again, a, a huge amount of staff to do this. Um, the deep water, they made a conscious effort not to use, say, true volunteers to handle the animals because they just didn't want a lot of people handling animals. But they use, they call them paraprofessionals, and that's somebody that has at least some experience or some background. So again, somebody that's worked in the main society or just has some background where they've, they've worked with animals or wild animals and so uh, train them to it to help out with this type of situation. Um, let's see if this works. So I did, I have a short video of how they actually wash a pelican. Um, and I think you'll get the...
Uh, transport we can introduce here, if you think about it, if you have smaller birds, you put them in a cage and take them back to where you caught them. Uh, and why it was a little different in that we were taking animals quite a bit distance away just so that we wouldn't release them into areas that were still being oiled. So we had uh, flat bottom boats, we had, uh, we flew birds to different locations. Um, Coast Guard had quite a large fleet of planes down there, and so what you would do is that they were flying somewhere that was close to, say, not a uh, wildlife refuge or someplace that had that species of bird on it, we would fly the birds there. Um, we had quite, uh, we had uh, two trucks like this under contract, and we had an 18 wheeler. So in the event that we got huge numbers of animals that we needed to transport, we had the ability to do that versus, say, um, and then the bird releases, you know, those are always pretty cool, and a lot of uh, a lot of folks there to watch that. Um, it's nice to see that at least uh, something's worked, and you were you know able to clean an animal and get them back into the environment. I will tell you, so one of the very first birds that we released, we took it. Um, so was, uh, I worked in Louisiana. We got to Louisiana. We released it in Georgia. So you know, quite a distance to. Um, in September, that bird came back to Louisiana. So that kind of also stopped our. Uh, but when we collect birds uh, and we watch them anywhere, now we find them quite a band on. So we're able to track them. And uh, just a like man comment like band, nothing, nothing more than that. And so, um, without doubt, at least for the pelicans, because they're such a big bird and they have a great homing, or homing instinct, this day started to come back. So, um, all our intents of taking birds away so that they wouldn't get alone again. Not that they necessarily flew back and got all over again, but those birds did come back. So um, I would think maybe next time we won't go to such extremes as to take the birds that are far away from their, their national home. So how fast did it come back? Well, that was uh, in July, and it came back in September, so it took you know, two or three months. Um, I didn't go into too much detail about this before, but again, so we, that, that's basically what we do as part of the response. But then once the response is done, Oftentimes, there's a legal case um, where the responsible party is uh, uh, has to come up with either money or projects to restore the environment from there still. And I just have a couple of examples to show you. Uh, North Cape oil spill that happened in Rhode Island, it was 800,000 gallons of fuel oil. Um, we had 400 dead birds. A lot of times what happens when you have oil birds is that, especially uh, in the north, East like this, it does sink once they're oiled. So you don't have to ever capture them. And so we have models that we use to say, well, this is the number that we've captured. We're going to extrapolate to what that really means in birds that we didn't capture. So estimating about 2,300 birds died. Um, so the thing here was on the circuit really whacked the lobsters. So almost 3 million lobsters were killed. So as part of that settlement, $27 million to pay for. Uh, that pays for both the cost to do the cleanup and to, to restore those resources. But eight million set aside for birds. And so what we do with that money is we work with our trustees. Again, NOAA in this instance, the states, local communities were, are involved with that, and do some restoration projects. And in this instance, we were able to protect about 1.5 million acres of bloom nesting habitat conservation units. We bought a 42 acre island to uh, provide for baby grounds for common eiders, which were one of the birds that were oiled. Um, because oil still a lot of times have a human impact, you know, all of a sudden you can't put your boat in the water, or you can't go fishing, or you can't hunt. The, the public is, is uh, uh, restored from that damage as well. And so this instance, because people couldn't use those beach, we did some projects to improve beach access. And then some herring and some lobster restoration. Uh, again, a big chunk that was to restore all the lobsters that were killed. Um, another example, this was um, 13 years ago over here in the Patoxy River, Hot Point spill. It was a pipeline break from one of the Pepto power plants. Um, not a huge amount of oil, 140,000 gallons, which you know, it's not a gigantic spill, but the problem was there was a nor'easter that night. And they had it boomed off pretty good. It was in this little cove, but all the booms broke. And then just because of the way the storm hit, the oil zigzags all the way down to the Tuxic River and out into the bay. And so a lot of impacts. Again, um, we, we measure injury. So in this instance, you know, running ducks and uh, wetlands and creeks. We settled for $2.5 to $2.7 million. 
And so in order to put that back, one of the things that we did was we restored some nesting habitat in North and South Dakota. You may think, well, this still happened in Maryland, why are you sending them on in North and South Dakota? But the thing was, is those ducks breed in North Dakota. So the thought was, is if you restore their breeding habitat, that's going to be more ducks to come back to the Chesapeake Bay um, when they're migrating. So that's um, the rationale we use for restoring that habitat. We also put money on the ground in the, uh, Maryland, so we have marsh creation, we did oyster seeding, um, and then again, we're uh, improving kayak and canoe access. Because again, during the period that there was natural cleanup there, many of the local boat ramps were closed, and so they would not let people with private boats um, put their boat in the water. Um, there was a, a period of time for that still actually that it was even closed to commercial traffic out in the bay so they could get the bigger streamers in there. Um, lastly, I, you know, today was all uh, oil spills and how we respond to oil spills, but I did want to let you all know that we as Fish and Wildlife Service do respond to many types of natural disasters. Um, and that's just because of the ability that we have. We have a lot of people that have a lot of skills and we have a lot of equipment. And so, um, and just as some examples, um, uh, let's go ahead my next one. So this was um, over a two week period last summer. Um, train derailment, latex fiber uh, mixture, we had uh, an ethanol spill, we had, um, uh, last summer one of the neighbors, the ground planes crashed. And because we have a lot of people that are skilled in operating uh, air boats, we assisted with the recovery of that. Um, and then Hurricane Ivy, uh, a couple of years ago, hit the northeast and caused a lot of damage. So they asked for our assistance to help uh, putting structures back, uh, fish passage structures to helping people put culverts back. Um, oftentimes in the spring, when there's flooding in, in the northern and upper Midwest, we, have, uh, we get assignments to go help and to, because they have all the airboats and people that can use airboats, to help uh, do uh, search and rescue and help people. Uh, rescue people. Um, oftentimes, we can help put the blue tarps on the roofs because we have uh, people that work in uh, local communities. Um, our national wildlife refuges have a lot of heavy equipment, especially the bigger refuges, so again, we can get called on to do road clearance or all helping uh, local communities by that. And so um, sometimes we have very formal arrangements with the community. So, for example, if you provide a bulldozer, the community will provide a gas or something like that. Other times, it's just because we have the people and the equipment there. That but we do get formal mission assignments from FEMA, for example. Um, we have um, one right now for Hurricane Sandy um, to help with some of the restoration work that they're doing for that. So again, not just not just oil and not just zero skills, but other things that we get asked to help So I think that's it. Um, uh, we have Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube sites. You can, you can catch up on things that we do there. Um, our website is at wsf.gov slash contaminants. That's the group that handles our oil spill and our hazardous waste response work. I'd be happy to take any questions if anybody has.